On the 13th of May 2014, the Court of Justice of the European Union handed down a very interesting decision called Google Spain and Spanish Data Protection Authority. Um, the European Court of Justice, by the way, being the European Union's top court. And it's this case which I want to talk to you about today. What was this case about? Well, it concerned a Spanish individual, a Mr. Gonzalez, who wanted to remove from Google's search index details relating to his bankruptcy, uh, which had arisen as a result of social security debts from some 10 years previously. He argued that this information was personal information or data under Spanish data protection law, itself an implementation of European data protection law, and he argued that it lacked any current relevance or public interest and was causing him prejudice or damage. Now he secured the support of the regulator, the Spanish Data Protection Authority for this, and in fact about 200 other people in similar situations also secured the support of the Spanish Data Protection Authority. But Google heavily contested legal liability, firstly before the Spanish courts, and when the questions were referred to the Court of Justice, also before the Court of Justice as well. So what were Google's key arguments? Well, they're really threefold. Firstly, Google said that Spanish and European law wasn't applicable in any case. The search engine was based in California, in the United States, and therefore only Californian state law and United States federal law was applicable. Secondly, although acknowledging that a processing, that is any operation, such as storage, uh, retrieval, dissemination, uh, analysis of personal information, any information related to an identified or identifiable individual, including public domain information, was going on, they did acknowledge that, they said that they weren't the controller of that processing and you need to be a controller to have responsibilities under data protection law. They said it was not them which was determining the purposes and the means of the processing in question. And in any case, they argued that to impose data controller responsibilities on them would have a profoundly chilling effect on fundamental rights, most notably the fundamental right to freedom of expression. Now in any large court of justice case like this, a, 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 an individual called an advocate general is charged with issuing an advisory opinion on the issues raised in the case and that opinion was handed down last June, June 2013. And apart from considering that Spanish and European law was in fact applicable, that opinion actually agreed with all of Google's core points. However, perhaps rather ominously, the Advocate General did state that the opposite conclusion might easily be defended as a logical conclusion of a literal and perhaps even a teleological, that is a purpose-driven, interpretation of European data protection law, the European Data Protection Directive. Driven by that literal and purpose-driven approach, the Court of Justice has now radically gone against all of Google's arguments. So what was the Court of Justice's understanding on the three points I mentioned? Let's take applicable law. Well, the Court pointed out that there was a, a subsidiary owned by Google called Google Spain which was selling and organising advertising on the site, which related to the index, in order to make the index profitable in Spain. And the court said, well, this showed that there was an in inextricable link between an entity which was clearly established on the soil of Spain and the index itself. And therefore, processing even on the index was taking place in the context of an entity established in Spain. Therefore, Spanish data protection law and, as a result, European data protection law was indeed 
applicable. Secondly, they totally agreed with Google that a processing of personal information was indeed going on. And they said, well, who else but Google was controlling that processing? Google was not obliged to create a search engine. It wasn't under any legal obligation to structure it in any particular way. It was determining the purposes and the means of the processing. Even if anyone else had been involved, it was certainly determining that jointly with others. And that was enough to make it a controller under European law. And on the fundamental rights point, far from constituting a chilling effect on fundamental rights, not to hold Google accountable in this way would prevent the full and effective protection of individuals like Mr. Gonzalez as data subjects, their rights, their rights to privacy, their other fundamental rights and freedoms implicated by processing of their data, such, for example, as the right to reputation. So how should we analyse this rather radical decision? Well, it's not at all surprising that the court went against the opinion of the Advocate General. The Advocate General's opinion was a strongly uh, policy-driven decision which was predicated on a maintenance of the internet as we know it currently. It was always difficult, if not impossible, to square with the basic structure of European data protection law. But what is more surprising, and in some cases very troubling, is that the Court of Justice seemed to go out of its way to enunciate the extent and the detail of the duties under data protection law, going well beyond what uh, the individual, Mr. Gonzalez, or the Spanish Data Protection Authority was actually arguing for. So the Spanish arguments were essentially that Google became a data controller as a result of receiving a request from an individual such as Mr. Gonzalez, or in other words, that that was when data protection responsibilities kicked in. And they said that in any case, Google would only have to remove material if the information lacked relevance or public interest and was causing the individual prejudice. However, on each of these counts, the approach of the Court of Justice was much broader. So let's look first at the idea of Google as a data controller. As far as the Court of Justice was concerned, Google did not become a data controller because it was receiving a request from a data subject. It became a data controller because it was processing data on its own account. In other words, it became a data controller as soon as it was gathering information from the web. Now, that is a very logical interpretation of European data protection law. But it implies that search engines have not just after the event obligations to perhaps remove material, but positive obligations to ensure that their processing complies with the rigours of data protection requirements. And that is a radical uh, uh, tension, that is in radical tension, with the whole automated nature of the way in which a search engine currently operates. Now the court clearly recognised some of these difficulties and introduced certain caveats in this regard. So what were the caveats? Well, they said that a, a search engine would only have responsibilities if its processing was liable to affect significantly and additionally the data subject's protection of privacy and their protection of personal data, additionally to original publication on a website. And they said that in any case, even when data controller responsibilities kicked in, these would only apply within the framework of a search engine's responsibilities, powers, and capabilities. But how limiting, in fact, are these conditions? Well, let's look at significant effect on the data subject to begin with. Here, the court was very clear 
that any, any processing by reference to the name or other identifier of a data subject would certainly implicate data subject rights more significantly than original publication. It would enable a whole profile of an individual to be built up. It would often be the key way in which information was disseminated. And both of these factors would mean that an individual's right to privacy and personal data protection would be much more severely implicated. So not much of a restriction there, at least if people are conducting searches on people's names, as is often the case. What about responsibilities? Well, under another piece of European legislation called the e-commerce directive, search engines may be shielded from liability in most cases before re receiving a request to remove material in situations such as copyright violation. But data protection responsibilities are explicitly excluded under European law from such a shield. Now, due to an incorrect implementation of the e-commerce uh, framework, it is intriguing that in the Spanish case, search engines would appear to have a shield even in the data protection context. But that is not the case in the vast majority of European countries, and nor is it the case under the binding requirements of European Union law. So it seems that the responsibilities of search engines are in fact in no way limited. What about the powers of a search engine? Well, again, the court was clear that the search engine's powers were not limited in relation to the uh, index. No one was compelling the index to do anything. No one was compelling it to be created. No one was compelling it to be organized in a particular manner. So we're left with the concept of capabilities. What are the capabilities of search engines in relation to this kind of material? And that essentially comes down to a value judgment about to what extent search engines should be compelled to change their business model to comply with the rigours of the law. Now, the court has already been clear that introducing a human element, an element of checking on request, is not a disproportionate effect or impact on the business model of a search engine. But privacy campaigners are bound to raise the issue as to whether proactive responsibilities on search engines should likewise be seen as not disproportionate to requirements under European data protection law. So should a human ele element be introduced proactively to check through material which is being indexed, which is likely to be illegal as a result of its privacy invading nature or its reputation damaging nature? Should a human element be introduced to check through predictive search results, which say link someone to intimate details related to their life or perhaps to criminal behavior? These are certainly live issues which will be raised as a result of this case. Let's now turn to look at data protection rights and duties as well. Here the court was also extremely expansive because they said that at least when information was inadequate, um, excessive or not relevant, then ordinarily an individual would have an absolute right to have material removed from the index even if it was causing that individual no prejudice. Now, as a partial caveat to that, the, the court did introduce uh, the concept that different considerations would apply if it appeared for particular reasons, such as the role played by the data subject in public life, that the interference with his fundamental rights was justified by the preponderant interest of the public in receiving that information in this way. So we do have a public interest test here, but it is very narrowly construed. 
it is narrowly construed in two senses. Firstly, it is focused on the concept of a public figure. In most cases, the individuals who will be contacting Google and other search engines will not be public figures, and nor will they be ana analogous to public figures. Secondly, it is striking that the court described the internet user receiving material through a search engine and the internet uh, search engine providing that material as mere interests. Despite the fact that Article 11 of the EU Charter, Article 10 of the European Convention, very clearly states that the imparting and receipt of information and ideas is part of a fundamental right, namely the fundamental right to freedom of expression. But the court didn't even see that as something which was engaged in the case, which is really a very striking uh, result. Beyond that, the court was also clear that material which was illegal to process under the directive should also be removed. Now, as regards many categories of data, that may simply require a weighing, a balancing between the interests of disseminating information in this way and the interests of the individual in having such information dissemination suppressed. But that is certainly not the case as regards whole categories of information which the directive defines as sensitive. And we're talking here of quite a long list of what many people consider the most interesting parts of information flow. Matters relating to health, sex life, political opinion, religious belief, and of course, criminality. Now the directive's rules here, as a general rule, are that private sector processing of such material is banned unless that suppression has been waived by the data subject, either as a result explicitly of their consent to that processing, or implicitly through them currently and manifestly making a decision to make that data public. Now, of course, member states have outlined certain narrow exemptions to that basic rule, notably for journalistic and allied purposes. However, despite not actually being asked this question directly, the court was quite clear that they did not consider that search engines met the journalistic and allied purposes test. And nor do they meet any of the other very narrow exemptions currently in member state law. It's an interesting question whether member states could in principle create such an exemption in the future. But interpreted literally, the current rules would be that a search engine would have to remove on request whatever the public interest was, which was present, sensitive personal information, and potentially even take steps not to index such material in the first place. But that obviously would be a radical infringement, or interference at least, with freedom of expression. And it's therefore unlikely to be accepted in this form, not only by search engines themselves, but even by European Union data protection authorities. But it is an indication, I think, of the extent of legal uncertainty, even in relation to fundamental rights such as freedom of expression, which the European Union data protection regime has created. And this case, almost as a sort of lightning bolt, has illuminated for us. So let's briefly look at the wider context. In principle, absent legislative reform, which would take many years, resolution of all the issues which I've been talking about should be a legal question. But the reality is very different. Why is it different? Well, the technicalities of data protection law are widely misunderstood. 
They are in unresolved and in many cases undiscussed conflict with other fundamental rights, notably the right to freedom of expression, and they've never been properly implemented on the ground. And in fact that gap between the legal technicality and the reality on the ground in the digital context continues to grow day by day. Now the court's vision of a law which provides complete and effective protection of data subjects privacy and other fundamental rights and freedoms is pretty close to what the founders of European data protection law intended and that vision has been bolstered by the inclusion of data protection as a fundamental right in the European Union Charter. But it is in profound tension with the understanding of data gathering and the way in which information is used, not just by large conglomerates such as Google, but by hundreds of millions of individuals online. Why do I say that? Well, data protection is predicated on the idea that all use and flow of personal information should be strictly regulated and controlled. But what is the mainstream internet understanding of information, particularly of public domain information, which is what we're talking about here? Well, I would argue it's that information should, absent extraordinary circumstances to the contrary, be completely free, free from legal regulation. Now that is almost the polar opposite of the data protection concept. So in reality, I think that proper and, and effective implementation of this decision will depend less on legal technicalities and more on a question of how powerful the ideal of data protection enunciated in the case is when put alongside the vast cultural, political and economic power of internet freedom. So we're clearly in for quite a lively debate, a debate about the entire future uh, architecture, if you like, of the internet and of our digital lives. The outcome of that debate will have profound implications for the rights and liberties of us all. So I hope that if nothing else, I've shown to you that this case is of interest to far more than lawyers and academics. It should be a case which is of interest to all of us as national, European and indeed global citizens.